Well, good evening, everyone. So happy that you have joined us tonight for this exciting program. Part of our webinar series of 2024 here at the Living Legacy Project. I'm Reggie Harris, and I'm coming to you tonight from deep in the Miles Standish National Forest in Massachusetts. I'm here all week singing, teaching two classes on the songs of civil rights movement and songs of healing and inspiration. And certainly in this very powerfully exciting time, we have a lot of reasons to think about healing and inspiration as we open up the floodgates of joy, working for peace and justice. So I'm going to sing a couple of songs with you tonight. I hope that you are in good voice tonight. Whatever voice you're in is good voice. We're going to start with a song that deeply part of the civil rights movement. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sing with me. Well, I woke up this morning with mind stayed on freedom woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom i woke up this morning with my mind oh it was a stayed on freedom hallelujah 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 yeah. sing it now Woke up this morning with my mind, hey, hey, stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind, yeah, stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind, oh, it was a stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, hallelujah, yeah, hallelujah. Now I'm singing and praying with my mind. Oh, it's a state on freedom. Singing and praying with my mind. State on freedom. I'm singing and praying with my mind. Well, now it's a state on freedom. Hallelujah. 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 Well, you gotta walk, walk, with your mind on freedom. Walk, walk, you gotta walk, walk, you gotta walk, walk, with your mind on freedom. Oh, 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 oh. walk, walk, you gotta walk, walk, and then you'll talk, talk, you gotta talk, talk, you gotta talk, talk, with your mind on freedom. Talk, talk, you gotta talk, talk, yeah, talk. Talk, mind on freedom. Oh, 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 talk, talk, you gotta talk, talk. Oh, well, there ain't no harm to keep your mind. Sing it out, say, stay on freedom. Ain't no harm to keep your mind. Well, it's a stay on freedom. Uh, ain't no harm to keep your mind. Well, now it's a stain on freedom. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I don't know if you woke up this morning with your mind stayed on freedom, but certainly in this exciting year and time, we are focused on freedom and justice. And the Living Legacy Project has been working for year after year after year to bring these webinar programs. We started these in 2020. And uh, as we know, the civil rights movement was always in uh, expressing itself and it 
was glued into place with songs, songs that rose up and inspired people to do what had right. Been down into the South, folks up there, both black and white. Been down into the South. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Been down into the South. Well, I never been to heaven, but I think I'm right. Been down into the South. Don't want to go without my civil rights. Been down into the South. Sing Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Been down into the South. I've been walking around to spread the news. Been down into the South. Now I got holes in all my shoes. Been down into the South. Sing Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Been down into the South. Well, if you don't think I've been through hell, just follow me down to Parchman Jail. Been down into the South. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Been down into the south. Well, the only thing that we did wrong. Been down into the south. Stay in the wilderness a day too long. Been down into the south. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Been down into the south. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, freedom, been down into the south. That was one of the great songs of the civil rights movement. A few months ago on a webinar, I had the privilege of interviewing Bob Zellner, who was the person attributed with changing that spiritual from been down into the sea, into been down into the south. And we're singing tonight to prepare ourselves to hear just an absolutely amazing, amazing story about one of America's true heroes, Bayard Rustin. And on the civil rights movement, people would gather and they would sing for hours to prepare themselves for the work ahead. They would sing, guide my feet while I run this race. Well, guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet now. One of the amazing things that Bayard Rustin was responsible for, one of the um, br brilliant things that he did, and you'll hear the story tonight, was when people voted with their feet and showed up in Washington at the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. We're still walking the journey, and we thank you for joining us here at Living Legacy Project tonight. We are so happy to put on this program to give you a chance to discover more about that amazing human being, Bayard Rustin. And to, uh, as our host tonight for our program, we have one of our board members, the Reverend Carlton, who is going to introduce and moderate this panel. Carlton, take it away. 
glad to do so. Uh, though I think Annette might have had a few remarks to make before we got underway. Thank oh, you so my, much for that well, wonderful opening, Reggie. It's beautiful. Absolutely. Annette, you're on. Thank you, Reggie, so much for being with us from deep in the woods in Massachusetts. Um, we really appreciate uh, your starting the night off with some music, uh, because how can you talk about the civil rights movement if you don't sing? So um, thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of that. Um, I'm Annette Marquis, and I'm the Director of Operations for the Living Legacy Project. Our organization conducts pilgrimages to important sites of the American Civil Rights Movement, providing experiential learning opportunities to deepen our understanding of the movement by visiting the sites where things happened, talking with the people who lived it, and exploring what those stories teach us about the work that still needs to be done today. We're especially happy to share stories of Bayard Rustin with you tonight. Our moderator is the Reverend Carlton Elliott Smith. Carlton is an author, motivational speaker, and business owner. His book, Try My Jesus, Daily Reflections to Free Your Mind, Deepen Your Faith, and Invite Universal Love into Your Life, is available wherever books are sold and on trymyjesus.com. An ordained minister in the Unitarian Universalist Association, he has served local congregations on the East and West Coasts for many years before joining the UUA's Southern Region Congregational Life Staff. As a native Mississippian, he values his inheritance from civil rights pioneers such as Ida B. Wells Barnett, Megder and, Megder and Merle Evers, Fannie Lou Hamer, Vernon Damer, and of course, Bayard Rustin. Carlton feels especially fulfilled when engaged in endeavors like he is tonight that carry their life-saving work forward. And being part of the Living Legacy Project is one of those, and we are honored and pleased to have you. Um, Carlton. The program will last about an hour tonight, and afterwards you can join us in the Zoom meeting to ask questions and engage with our panelists in a more relaxed atmosphere. Um, the chat will be moderated tonight by Pam Zappardino, a member of our board. So if you have any questions or or uh, want to share some, um, some of what resonates with you tonight, please feel to, free to do that in the chat. And on that note, I will turn it over to Carlton. Thank you so much, Annette, for that great introduction and all the work you do for the Living Legacy Project behind the scenes uh, from an administrative standpoint. You've been truly instrumental. And I am thrilled this evening for the opportunity to be in conversation with our guest on the 61st anniversary of the March on Washington as we honor its organizer, Bayard Rustin. First, a few words about our guest this evening. Bennett Singer has been making documentaries about social justice for more than 25 years. In addition to Brother Outsider, which he co-directed and I highly recommend, and is available uh, in many form formats on the internet, Bennett's credit include Eyes on the Prize 2, an Emmy-winning series on the history of the civil rights movement, Electoral Dysfunction, a documentary about voting rights in America that won the ABA Silver Gavel Award for Fostering Understanding of the Law, and Cured, which tells the story of the activists who persuaded the American Psychiatric Association to remove the diagnosis of homosexuality from its Manual of Mental Disorders in 1973. Bennett is the former executive editor of Time Magazine's education program and the author or editor of five books, including most recently LGBTQ Stats, an almanac of facts and figures on the LGBTQ revolution that he co-authored with his husband. We're also joined this evening by Walter Nagel, who is Bayard Rustin's life partner for the last decade of Rustin's life. In 2013, he accepted the Presidential Medal of Freedom that President Barack Obama bestowed posthumously on Rustin at a White House ceremony. Walter serves as executive director of the Bayard Rustin Fund, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sustaining Rustin's vision of a more peaceful and equitable world.
An accomplished photographer, he accompanied Rustin on a number of international missions to investigate the conditions of refugees and prospects for democracy in countries experiencing social change, including El Salvador, Haiti, and South Africa. He is the co-author of Troublemaker for Justice, the story of Bayard Rustin, an acclaimed biography for young people, and was a historical consultant on the 2023 Netflix biopic entitled Rustin, Rustin starring Coleman Domingo. Walter Nagel and Bennett Singer, welcome to Who Knew, the Living Legacy Project's 2024 education series, where we are lifting up lesser sung heroes, sheroes, and theyros of the civil rights era. Thank oh. you for the invitation. Oh, you're most welcome. So glad you're here. So uh, let's get into a bit about Bayard Rustin's life and vision. So this first question is for you, Bennett. How did you first learn about Bayard and what inspired you to make this film about his life and work? Mm. Well, let me start by saying thank you. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here with, with everyone who's joining us. And what an inspiring way to get the conversation started, um, to hear such uplifting music despite the bandwidth issues the spirit was absolutely <laughs> uh very clear and very uh uplifting so that was really uh a great way to to segue into this conversation and as you said it is the 61st anniversary of the march on washington for jobs and freedom so the timing is incredibly apropos um for me, I, I went to college in Boston and um, stumbled onto an internship after my senior year at Blackside Inc., which is the production company in the South End um, that produced Eyes on the Prize. Actually, you know, it just occurred to me, I'm in Boston right now visiting some relatives and I, I was seized by just like a couple hours ago. I was, I haven't been by, you know, the, the, company uh the headquarters of that company in years but i walked by 486 shaman avenue a couple hours ago and the company is no longer exists in existence henry hampton the founder passed away some years ago condos are now <laughs> for better or worse um at least the building hasn't disappeared but it you know for me it was it was such a life-changing opportunity um, it was supposed to be this two-month summer internship, turned into five years of projects, um, and really was the equivalent of film school. But at the beginning, my very first assignment was can, you know, to fact check the section of the film and the companion book on the March on Washington. And so, like on day two of my <laughs> of my first ever job or you know, post-college experience. I discovered Bayard Rustin, whom I had never heard of, despite having taken various history courses where I should have heard of him, but I hadn't heard of him. And the more I learned about him, the more I came to understand. It, it really struck me that, you know, I had to ask myself, was I reading a novel about a fictional character dreamed up by a very inventive author? Or was this, in fact... A character or a figure from history and obviously it, he was a figure from history but the more i came to understand about his central role in bringing gandhi's ideas of nonviolence from india to america becoming a mentor to dr king during the montgomery bus boycott organizing as we will talk much more about the largest protest of the civil rights movement and through it all being remarkably open during the 40s and 50s and 60s about being a gay man and connecting those issues of racial justice and economic justice and liberation for LGBTQ folks in one very intersectional life. It seemed to me that, you know, um, his story deserved to be told. And, and that was back in the 80s when I first encountered Rustin um, fast forward about more than 10 years from that moment. And I ended up teaming up with a friend of mine, Nancy Cates, who also was motivated to tell Rustin's story and with several of the people who had been on the Eyes on the Prize team, including Sam Pollard, our executive producer, 
and our cinematographer, Bobby Shepard, Lillian Benson, one of our editors. Um, so there was a whole kind of confluence of filmmakers and some and quite a number of civil rights activists and historians who came together to be part of our team. And like any film, it was absolutely a team effort. It did take us five years, but the basic impulse was, it seemed to us that Rustin had been forgotten by history, marginalized by history, erased from history, or even, as one writer has put it, expunged from history. And that process of expunging someone from the historical record is obviously not about forgetting them unintentionally. It's a very conscious effort. And so we set out very consciously to rediscover Rustin and unerase, if you will, uh, the the omission and, and really to bring him back from the margins to the center. And that, I think, was what was driving us to to tell his story. Thank you for that, Bennett. And you were certainly on the front end of bringing his story to the fore. Uh, and of course, uh, by the time the President of the United States is on the bandwagon, you know you've got some momentum going. Uh, Walter, thank you for that. And Walter, we wanted to check in with you. What would you say explains Bayard's tr remarkable self-confidence and authenticity? How did his identity or sense of self develop? Well, I think it, it really goes back to his childhood. He was raised in Westchester, Pennsylvania, a small town in southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, fairly close to the Mason-Dixon line. And he was raised by his grandparents. His mom, his biological mom was not married at the time and her prospects for being able to raise a single child on her own in that time, we're talking about 1912 now, uh, you know, we're not good. So his grandparents decided to take him in as their, I guess, uh, seventh or eighth child, if you will. Um, and his grandmother was, his grandmother was Quaker. She had, she was the daughter of someone who had worked as a domestic worker in a Quaker household in Westchester, rather prominent family. And Julia Rustin Bard's grandmother went to Quaker school in Westchester for a couple of years. Um, so she really instilled in Bard the sense of Quaker values the universality of the human family, but more, even more importantly, the belief to be authentic, to be true to your true self and to be who you are openly and, and unafraid. So that influence was very early on. And then when Bard started school, uh, a number of his teachers really saw, I think, tremendous potential, uh, both intellectually, but also um, socially. I mean, Bard was a sort of a gregarious kid he was very athletic, he was very musical, a, a kid of really many talents. And I think his teachers uh, nurtured all of those abilities that he, that he had. So he really grew up, I, at home he really had a strong sense of being loved uh, and being appreciated and that was further added to in his uh, school experience. So it really goes back to that time. Thank you for that, Walter. And and Bennett, as Walter was just explaining, I mean, there were these all of these many ways in which uh, Bayard was not typical. He was a Quaker in a sea of Baptist and Methodist preachers. He was a gay man. He was uh, someone who was affiliated with the Communist Party. Um, all of these different things. Um, so the title of the film, Brother Outsider, speaks to both the sense of being closely related and yet somehow kind of kept at a distance as well. And Bayard brought so much that defied people's assumptions about who he was and who he was and how he was and why. What were some of the space, what were the spaces that you would say where Bayard was actually like a brother insider, where he actually had a sense where he was, he belonged and there wasn't any resistance uh, at all to what he was bringing to the table beyond his relationship with Walter, of course. <laughs> right. I love that question. And I, you know, as with so many projects, we struggle to find the best title. Um, there is a line in the film where Rustin himself says, we need in every community a group of angelic troublemakers. And for a while we thought, well, angelic troublemakers isn't bad, you know, to put, to capture one part of his work. But in some ways, Brother Outsider, as you are saying, I think is better in the sense that it, it captures that duality 
of being inside various movements, but also an outsider, you know. Um, and it's interesting. I think there were spaces in which he was an insider, but sometimes that sense of being part of a group and being included shifted. For instance, I think in his early organizing days, he was part of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which was this piece, this group of activists who were out there campaigning for pacifism and 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 espousing the values of peaceful social change. And even though there were few other African-American activists who were part of that group, I think Rustin really found a huge community, huge sense of solidarity with folks in that movement and was so passionate about it until he, his homosexuality became an issue as we show in the film. And he was forced to leave that, that community um, because they had not come to recognize, and it was the early 1950s, it's understandable, I think if, if you remember the context, but his openness about being gay just, just was not viable within that community, especially given the views of, of its leader, A.J. Musty, the Reverend A.J. Musty, um, who was radical in a lot of ways, but I think on that issue was not ready to open up, not, you know, was not an affirming um, faith community in that, in that moment. So there was, you know, that, that was a sense in which his insiderness shifted to outsiderness. Um, and Walter maybe can talk more about this. I mean, I think as a gay man, he did find spaces like so many other LGBTQ folks in the forties and fifties, where he could be his authentic self without fear of, of, of being, um, ostracized or marginalized and yet those spaces were so shadowy and, and underground often and subject to raids or subject to you know displacement um it's i think it's striking in the film his early partner davis platt who was rustin's life partner in the 40s and walter his his life partner in the 70s and 80s both say that they met what they they connected when their eyes met and and you know sparks followed but that process of of looking at someone and and having a personal connection i think is so common for lgbtq folks and you know and a, a sort of this silent form or way of connecting with people and i again i think it's there's a insiderness to that sort of context but also a sense of of really being under the radar and sort of on i don't know if it's on the down low exactly but but being um hidden in plain sight you know and i think that duality again was even was 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 often part of rustin's existence so even when he was with folks who were very much kindred spirits there was this sense that but that 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 harmony or that comfort could be displaced could be disrupted um could be interrupted so it was i think a constant dance or a constant awareness that even when he was an insider he he that status wasn't necessarily secure or safe and yet all i also want to say that you know the sense of joy and the sense of charisma and energy and it's, it's you know Walter can talk more about this too, but I my sense is it was such a constant part of Rustin's personality, um, and so maybe you know that is epitomized so clearly in his singing and in his his love of music and his use of music as part of his activism, and so certainly you know for the it was such a gift for us as filmmakers to have two recordings of Rustin singing spirituals and other songs and everywhere we possibly could, we use those, those songs and that, which do convey the sense of joy and activism as um, the soundtrack of the film. And they have this uncanny way, not only of, of being beautiful music, but of telling stories and of 
telling Rustin's own life story. So in some ways, it's a form of narration, whether it's Scandalize My Name or Careless Love or Lonesome Valley. The lyrics of those songs have a way of of telling Rustin's own story while conveying that sense of of joy and and sort of wonder that I think was with him through his 75 years. Thank you for that, Bennett. Uh, yeah, and I think I'll take a cue from you and see, Walter, if you have anything to say about uh, his sense of belonging or the places where he found belonging, as well as the ways that uh, Bayard Rustin's music and singing was able to bring people together. Well, I think that I think Bayard really in the 40s and the 50s, um, he really had a sense of community with the other activists that he was working with, the people in the FOR, the people in what became core, the Congress of Racial Equality, with his colleagues. I think the problem was with the administration of those organizations and or slash the board of directors, because they're responsible for sort of um, holding up a certain ideal, if you will, or a certain uh, sense of what the organization is. And so they're, you know, and they have to be fiscally responsible. They have to raise money for the organization. So, you know, things like Bayard being, you know, fairly openly gay uh, and occasionally getting into trouble because of that, it was it was hard for them to, to tolerate it. But his fellow activists were perfectly fine with it. Uh, they loved him. They loved his singing. He was always referred to as the life of the party uh, when there was a party. And there was a lot of partying. And Davis talks about that uh, in some of the interviews in there. So he was, Davis was clearly accepted by Bayard's uh, colleagues in the movement as his partner at the time, his lover, if you will. Um, so there was, there was a certain comfort level, but again, it was with the higher ups, if you will, who always tend to be a little more conservative than their constituents. So that was, that was, that was, a, that became an issue. Mm -hmm. And his singing was, it was really an integral part of who he was. He had been singing since he had been really in grammar school, middle school, high school. And when he came to New York, he started, he, he earned part of, or sometimes earned his living singing with Josh White. He was a backup singer to Josh. It was Josh White and the Carolinians. And Bard was one of the Carolinians. He also had a very brief appearance on Broadway with Paul Robeson in a short-lived play called John Henry. So uh, when he was in the movement, he used his singing talents to bring people together, to start meetings, to finish meetings, sometimes to, um, shall we say, derail tension. If there was a demonstration going on and they had reached a point where there was sort of an impasse, perhaps between the police and the demonstrators, Bayard would get up and start singing and people would join in and, you know, it gave everybody a chance to take a breath and step back and figure out what their next move would be. So it was really a, a very important tool in his activism. Yes, I'm just thinking about uh, even later in his life, there's a scene in the film where he is with a group of children. I can't remember which country it was in, but um, just start engaging with them. And I don't think they had a language in common, but he used music as a way of building a bridge. And that was really a beautiful thing to see. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, let's turn a little bit of attention towards the March on Washington, which, of course, uh, I guess I, I would I would venture to say was the pinnacle of his career, having organized it and having done such a powerful job with that, even though A. Philip Randolph was uh, the surface organizer or the organizer of, of note, but Bayard was right behind the scenes, uh, making sure that everything happened and went smoothly. Um, Bennett, I'm wondering if you can tell us more about his interactions with the other civil rights leaders of that day, Dr. King, Adam Clayton Powell, and A. Philip Randolph. To what extent would you say his openness about being gay was an issue for them, and what was he able to teach them uh, through his example and through the, his openness about his life? Well, I think he did absolutely teach anyone he encountered a lot about the existence of gay people and that sense of um, self-assurance and dignity and, and self-confidence that he brought. As you mentioned in the intro, I did recently co-direct a, a new film called Cured about um, the activists who challenged that notion that was 
um, so pervasive at the time, you know, according to doctors and psychiatrists, every single gay person was automatically classified as being mentally ill by the psychiatric association. And that was codified in the first um, diagnostic and statistical manual, which was published in 1952. And so that, that was what the establishment was saying. That was what the experts were telling society, including, you know, progressive folks. So it, it was so radical that Rustin rejected that view and, and really, you know, I think tying back to what Walter was saying about his Quaker upbringing and his, his insistence on authenticity and his refusal to compromise that sense of authenticity. He, he really was out there saying, this is who I am. I have no need to apologize. I will refuse to hide. I refuse to lie. I refuse to get married, you know, and that he brought that into all of his, his um, professional experiences with Dr. King and others. There's an essay I, I just was reviewing, um, which is online um, at the Advocate website. It's called Martin Luther King's Views on Gay People by Bayard Rustin. And he makes the point um, in the first paragraph where he says, my, my being gay was not a problem for Dr. King, but it was the problem for the movement. And I think that encapsulates what Walter was getting, um, you know, suggesting earlier and what really you see in the film that um, Dr. King, uh, A. Philip Randolph, recognized Rustin's brilliance as an organizer, his unparalleled skill and wisdom, and really wanted to include him in, in their work and in, within, in the movement more broadly. Um, but there were indeed um, reasons to think that his his openness made him a liability and and that you know is is certainly true with the decision about rustin becoming a leader of the march on washington as he talks about in this essay that i mentioned you know roy wilkins from the mwacp told rustin that or objected to rustin's having a public leadership role in that effort and it was in part because of his openness about being gay his also, also his decision during World War II to be a conscientious objector, for which he served three years in federal prison. It's not like he dodged the draft and ran to Canada. He fully acknowledged his, his position as one of, you know, a person of conscience and was very open and, and direct and paid a price for that. Um, as Gandhi and Dr. King and other other leaders of civil disobedience have done over the centuries. Um, and he had been a member of the Young Communist League, which, you know, sort of was used against him, even though he renounced the um, his membership and really shifted from that organization very early in his career, but it was used against him. And so I think um, folks, including Dr. King, and Roy Wilkins definitely had this set of concerns about Rustin and the potential liability that he brought to any organizing effort. Um, but I also think that uh, Dr. King really, um, and Randolph really saw the unique skill that that Rustin and no one else could have brought to, to organizing the march. I'll also say quickly, and there is a whole scene on this in the film, A. Philip Randolph, I, sorry, Adam Adam Clayton Powell, um, I should say, challenged a um, a protest that A. Philip Randolph and Dr. King were planning in 1960 at the Democratic Convention, which you know I was thinking about as as I watched this year's DNC um, and the question of protests and what would be allowed and what kind of visibility would they get and how much of an impact would they make. But Randolph and King had planned. Uh, a, a protest at the 1960 DNC, Adam Clayton Powell, congressman from Harlem, did not want that protest to happen. And in order to derail and, and get the protest canceled, Powell threatened Dr. King and with this blackmail threat, really saying, if you move ahead with this protest, I will spread the false rumor that 
Dr. King and Rustin were engaged in a sexual affair. And it worked because to I think to Rustin's surprise or disappointment, certainly, um, Dr. King allowed him to resign, canceled the protests. And in that case, you know, um, it was it was really quite a demoralizing um moment in Rustin's trajectory. But he did come back together with Dr. King by 1963 for the march. And I think through the decades, you know, the net result of his openness was that he 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 was a living um, example of the interconnection of of the fight for justice. And and in Rustin's view, being silent and 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 guarded or hiding one piece of his identity while fighting openly for you know racial justice and economic justice it just wasn't in his vocabulary. And again, it's that basic refusal to compromise when it comes to authenticity that that guided him and I think did teach his colleagues so much about what, you know, the full scope of his humanity. Yes, and I think we just have to give a little bit of a hat tip to uh, Ma Rustin, who was his grandmother, who for his childhood he thought was his mother because his mom was actually an unwed mother at the time that he was born. But um, to have that kind of affirmation from the person who's raising you so early in life makes a huge difference, I know. Uh, Walter, I wanted to ask you on this uh, 61st anniversary of the March on Washington, what what do you think it achieved? I mean, we know that it was like a quarter of a million people and such a peaceful demonstration and so well organized and getting people in and out and there wasn't any sort of outbreak of violence. And we see in the film, uh, in both the film Rustin and Brother Outsider, how people, how even the police were mobilized and trained so that they would respond correctly. What demands do you think that he delivered on that day got fulfilled and which ones didn't still remain to be fulfilled? Well, I think to a large degree, um, they've all been fulfilled to a point, not completely fulfilled. I don't think any of them have been completely fulfilled. Um, you know, some of the schools in New York City are the most the racially segregated uh, in the country. Uh, and, it, you know, it's not under law. It's not by law. You know, it, it happens to be because of the way neighborhoods are situated, et cetera. And that kind of integration over can take a, a tremendous amount, of, a tremendously long period of time to actually happen. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and make it happen. Um, certainly, I think the economic issues that were raised, uh, talking about, you know, access to health care, uh, income inequality, uh, fair uh, fair wages, uh, memberships in labor unions, you know, all of those things have improved, but certainly not to the degree that uh, where we, we would have liked them to be. And in some ways, some have gotten worse. The income inequality gap is actually, I think, probably worse than it was at the time, 1963. So we have a long way to go. On it. But I think, again, a lot of it has to do with the economic challenges that we still face and lift you know lifting everybody up into a higher standard of living uh that's really i think that the, the job ahead of us i could quickly add to uh -huh. just to jump in that um one of the amazing documents that ties into the march on washington is the organizing manual that rustin wrote to prepare people for that day um and it is on our website brotheroutsider.org free to download um, but it, I think it's such a great encapsulation of Rustin's talents and his his multiple um, focuses, foci, foci, <laughs> his ability to focus on multiple things in the in a given document. Like it's it, the philosophical piece of it um, is brilliant. It's, he's saying it's it's been a hundred years since the Emancipation Proclamation, and yet there are so many unfulfilled promises. And then on the next page, it's all about the logistics, you know, like August 28th is going to be a hot summer day. And here's what you should and should not bring for lunch, because we don't want people getting sick if they eat, you know, spoiled food and, and remember the license plate number of the bus that you came on and take an index card and 
I just love that document. So I, I wanted to mention to people that it is available at brotheroutsider.org, along with a bunch of other writings by Rustin. And, and I saw in the chat, too, people were asking, how can they watch the film? If you go to brotheroutsider.org slash watch, you'll find half a dozen links to platforms, including Netflix and Canopy, which is free with a library card um, and some other options. But we're thrilled that, that the film, which has been around for quite a while, is reaching a whole new generation of viewers. And more importantly, that Rustin's story is being discovered by millions of people around the globe at this point, which is, is so heartening. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, you were talking about uh, taking out the index card. I'm just remembering that um, you know, yes, it was a different, it was a totally different time. It wasn't like whip out your cell phone or go to this website or anything like that. A phone was something that hung on the wall or uh, it wasn't something that you could carry around with you and communicate with people. Um, uh, I've got a question uh, for both of you. Uh, it's about uh, Dr. King's relationship with Bayard. Um, and that is that to say that their relationship fluctuated over the years. And this is both evident in the Rust and Biopic as well as in Brother Outsider. They worked very closely together in Montgomery and then Bayard went into the background and they converged at the March on Washington, but would later diverge over King's outspoken opposition to the Vietnam War. What would you all say are, were the commitments that kept bringing them back together in spite of their strategic differences and otherwise? Well, I certainly think uh, something that Bennett mentioned earlier, there were things that Bayard could do that nobody else in the movement could do. So when they needed those kinds of talents, they had to bring him back in whether they necessarily liked it or not. Um, the other thing is, you know, Dr. King, Dr. King was very well educated. He had come to the North. He was a little more sophisticated than some of the people he was working very closely with who had never left the South. And, you know, he was just a little more worldly, if you will. And he was somebody, Bayard, and he could relate um, very easily and very clearly on, a, on an intellectual level that he might not have been able to do that with all of the people that he worked with. So I think that uh, also was um, something that helped their bond and help, helped them to grow as human beings. I would say, too, they, you know, they were both intent on on building a national movement and rustin i think saw very early the the p potential trajectory beyond the montgomery bus boycott or with that as a catalyst for a a more national movement and that sense of building on that amazing success and and which was i think as successful as it was in large part because of rustin's involvement even though he again that ar the arrest record and the openness about being gay really haunted him and 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 was made him a target and he had to be very under the radar but he did impart to dr king a lot about the mechanics of leading a nonviolent movement and of course dr king went on to win the nobel prize for peace and to become this iconic peaceful leader of our society um, on, the low, on a global level. Um, but that sense of building on their early, their first work together, which was Montgomery and creating a, a, a broad national movement, which uh, in some ways is was exemplified by the, the 1963 March. Um, I think that commitment really did transcend and, and overcome a lot of the tensions that flared up between them over the years. Keeping the eyes on the prize, I think we could say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah awesome. I like it, yes. <laughs> uh, Bennett, I've got a question for you. Uh, uh, if we were thinking about Bayard, if he were with us today, what do you think he'd say about the ongoing struggles for racial justice and LGBTQ equality? Well, I think he might say, among other things, that we have to be vigilant about pushing back against efforts to divide us. He would say, I think there's so much fear mongering when I think about the way that trans issues and trans people and trans lives have become such a target and such a cynical 
fear inducing um wedge you know the idea of of trans people you know as predators and and, and um the efforts to stop trans people from gaining access to life affirming medical treatments and and to interfere with people's ability to you know make their own decisions about their own bodies um i think he would be very mindful of that and 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 try to move beyond the surface level and, and and think about like what is motivating this kind of opposition or backlash and how can we come together he was always about coalitions and and he certainly recognized that allies and coalitions had a transformative potential in some ways that was you know what made the march on washington such a success and so much so many other efforts that Rustin organized, that sense of bringing people together. And he also, I think, was always an advocate of speaking out and, and demonstrating for one's own rights, but also for the rights of other marginalized or oppressed people. And so I think he would you know, be very mindful of saying, we need to support one another. And you know, there is this intersectional potential to lift up multiple causes and to come together more often and more openly and more consciously um, whenever any of us are are uh, being targeted. Yes, and I think that's one of the things that um, we can say that I know it's been one of the foci, if you will, for uh, President Barack Obama. And in that vein, um, Walter, I wanted to ask you, um, since Bayard received that posthumous Presidential Medal of Freedom and you were at the White House on that occasion, how much of a turning point do you think that event was in terms of the recognition of Bayard and his leadership and his vision and what he brought to history? I think it was very significant. Um, you know, things had been kind of happening sort of gradually and in steps. You know, we had a, a two or three biographies that came out. And then Brother Outsider came out the same year as John D'Amelio's a very important book called Lost Prophet, Biography of Byard. Um, and so I think the momentum was, was building. And then as we approached 2013, which of course was the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, it kind of made sense to put forth an effort to make this happen. And so we worked um, with the civil rights organizations, with the authors of all of the biographies that were out at that time. Uh, we had some powerful allies in uh, uh, John Lewis and Eleanor Holmes Norton. And of course we had the first African-American president. So there were a lot of things that sort of converged and came together and kind of made it just the right time. So um, I think, you know, all, all of those factors kind of made it made a difference and, and, and made it happen. Um, it was an and it was an important day. I think it was it introduced Byard's name um, just you know on the nightly newscasts. Um, I was hearing from <laughs> I was hearing from people that I went to high school with who didn't even know that I had been involved with this guy, and I guess they were listening in the news and suddenly they heard my name and they ran to their television sets. So I mean it, it you know it immediately lifted Byard's profile to a to a, a different level, as has. Uh, last year's Netflix film, uh, you know, made it more worldwide, if you will. But 2013 was was very important to that, and and it was the first time that uh, two LGBTQ partners were there to accept awards in memory of their loved ones. Me, of course, for Bard and Sally Wright's partner, Tam O'Shaughnessy, was also there that day. So it was it was important in a lot of ways. Yes, and, and you had mentioned uh, the Rustin uh, film. I know that you were uh, one of the consultants on that. Could you say a bit about your role in, in what we finally saw on screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had a, I'm listed as a historical consultant. I had, you know, I wouldn't say I had a major role in the development of the script, but I, you know, I was interviewed by the people who are, are credited with writing the script. Dustin Lance Black and Julian Brees. Um, and 
I ha- I commented, you know, on a couple of the drafts of the script and, you know, there were some changes made accordingly. Some changes were not made. Uh, you don't know, you know, uh, Bennett was talking about coalitions earlier. And I think that this film sort of is a coalition. You have producers, you have directors, you have, of course, the writers, the actors, and everybody kind of has to work together. And we're not, we're not all going to get everything we want, but hopefully we end up with a product that we are happy with. And I think that was certainly the case with me. I think uh, Coleman Domingo's performance was tremendous in really embodying Bayard's spirit, his integrity, his courage, uh, his organizing ability, and of course, his sense of humor. So he really, uh, he really did Bayard justice. And I could quickly add too, I don't know sure. if you mentioned it, but the executive producers of the Netflix feature film on Rustin were the Obamas. So they, President Obama and, and Michelle Obama really, I think were determined to help bring a film about him into the world uh, within the world of, of feature films with a script. And, you know, I think there is the reality that even the most popular documentary reaches a more limited generally reaches a more limited universe than um, than a feature film. But I'm really happy from our point of view on the documentary side that now um, folks can go to Netflix and, and watch both of them. And, you know, there was a, a New York Times review earlier this year that made the point that um, the films really do go together and that the, the feature film really focuses on the March on Washington and that small period of Rustin's life and our film is attempting to be a a biography of his whole life starting with his early activism and his childhood and going to the very end of his life as a international human rights activist as you said singing with children and in refugee camps in in Thailand or was it Cambodia Walter (laughs) I believe it was Thailand but it was you know close to the Thai Cambodian border yeah Anyway, they do fit together, and I hope folks who haven't had a chance to see both of them will will consider tuning in. A hundred percent. I highly recommend both of those uh, films, and it's, they do support one another for sure. Uh, we just have a few more minutes left, and I wanted to get in just a couple of more questions um, for both you, Walter, and Bennett. One of Byers' convictions that surfaces in the film Brother Outsider is that once uh, access to the ballot box was secured, there wasn't as much need for protests, nonviolent or otherwise, because people could then exercise their power through the polls. Today, we have the most diverse representation among our elected officials as ever in the United States. Black people have served with distinction at the highest levels of the government, obviously. And at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, protests were, were kept, protests were kept at a distance from the proceedings, much different from the Democratic National Conventions in 1964 and 68. Thinking of Byers' convictions, where do each of you see the place of nonviolent protest now in creating change relative to the power of the vote? Well, I think, you know, Byard was, Byard always believed that nonviolent protest, protest, particularly nonviolent protest, was important. It was an important uh, element in your toolbox. And it was, you really needed to use it when an is- a particular issue wasn't being paid attention to either in the press or by government officials or something. And even it might be an issue that wasn't very widely known in the general public. And so you used, you really used protest to draw attention to your cause, if you will. Um, But then if you really wanted to have real change made, you needed to have legislation passed. You needed to have uh, people in Congress advocating so that those laws could be passed. But the way you put pressure, would you build up pressure to make those things happen was in fact by having protests. So both of those things were important. Um, you never really had to give up protest, but you needed to use it strategically and not just be out in the streets uh, at the drop of a hat. And certainly the idea of protest was to convince your opposition, if you will, convince your, I don't, I'm reluctant to use the word enemies. It's not a word that Bayard used very much. But, you know, you wanted to 
uh, win the hearts and minds of people, to convince people. And you don't always do that by being angry, by screaming, by, you know, being disruptive. You do it by demonstrating peacefully and talking, you know, talking with people. Thank you for that, Walter. Bennett, what would you add? I would add that in some ways that those, you know, those strategies are as relevant in 2024 as they were in 1954 or 63. And, you know, we obviously we have shifted as this webinar reminds us to a virtual world. And there's so much potential that can be achieved through the Internet and through social media, including organizing efforts. But I, I, I having been at a number of of marches and and um seen the the unmistakable impact that these in person events can have on folks as organizers i think there's nothing you know that that tradition has a huge part to play in our ongoing movement towards a more, you know, a more perfect union towards social justice. Um, so it's, I think it's a mistake to say everything can be done online and our phones are, are the answer. Our phones can help remind people where the march or the rally is happening, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's, you know, it, it's tempting to, to think that um, everything has shifted or, you know, that there is a new paradigm, but in some ways I think the, the, you know, the idea of bringing a million people or a half a million people together, it just sends such a message. And, and it empowers every one of those people who shows up, I think, which leads to the point that, you know, in, in, in some ways, I think one of the big takeaways of Rustin's work was that every single one of us can, can be an activist on some level. You don't have to be a professional, you know, protester or to be working officially for a, an, a protest organization to 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 engage in activism and whether it's you know around the family dinner table or in your faith community or in your neighborhood each of us i just think you know and rustin i think would would really drive that point home has has so much potential to to speak truth to power, which, by the way, is a phrase that he invented or is it popularized. Um, so that's another tidbit. There's, you know, there was so much to to try to weave into the film that didn't make it in, but um, that that point of, of of his whole life was about speaking truth to power, and I think all of us have the ability to continue that legacy. Yes, and uh, there's more that could be said about Bayard Rustin's life than we can even include in an hour webinar. <laughs> so I, we're Very at the true, end of yeah. our time now. Um, and I, and fortunately, we have another half an hour of conversation that will follow this uh, after uh, Annette closes us out in a moment. And I'm going to, the first question I want to ask is, is like, how, what do you think about Bayard's contribution to this moment? We're on the verge of uh, electing the possibility, possibility. <laughs> I say it's going to happen, uh, of electing the first woman uh, president uh, in the United States and a woman of color at that. So I look forward to hearing your commentary on that when we uh, get into our uh, discussion in the other room. But in the meantime, thank you, Walter Nagel, executive director of the Bayard Rustin Fund, and Bennett Singer, co-director of the film Brother Outsider, The Life of Bayard Rustin. It's been wonderful being in conversation with you this evening. Thank you for inviting us. Absolutely. Thank you, Carlton, for your wonderful hosting of this incredible conversation. Um, and again, thank you, Walter and Bennett. Uh, really valuable. Uh, we we hope you all will join us in the discussion room in a few minutes. I do want to just close out by saying that Living Legacy Project is a nonprofit organization. We're committed to inspiring today's work for racial justice by taking people to the South to meet people involved in the civil rights movement then and now. Um, your support of our work will allow us to continue to bring you great programs like this and expand our reach into colleges and universities and other communities that need these important messages. 
So please uh, consider us when you think about uh, how your donation dollars are shared. We look forward to seeing all of you on September 25th when we will host Gwendolyn Zohara Simmons, a longtime civil rights activist from Freedom Summer to today. We hope to see you then, and we hope to see you in the um, discussion room in a few minutes. Thank you all. <laughs>